We have a lot of lovely, smart, inspiring people on this podcast. Leaders in learning, all of them. But a good deal of them are, let's be honest, getting on a bit like me, which raises the question, who is going to replace them when they retire? Who are going to be the gurus and CLOs of the next generation? Where are the rising stars? People, we've got one right here. Welcome to The Learning Hack, a podcast about the people and technologies that are creating the future of learning. I'm John Helm. Now guess what? Learning is learning cool. Is cool. cool. Learning is cool. Learning is cool. Learning is cool. I'm learning. Learning is fun. And knowledge is power. Knowledge. Education. Towards the end of last year, something quite extraordinary happened. I was asked by the Learning and Performance Institute to help judge the Rising Stars category of their learning awards. And that was where I met the extraordinary young man who is my guest on the Learning Hack podcast this time. Tell us about him, Kate. Hack Facts. Federico Prasicci is Head of Sales Training and Enablement at GDS Group, an accredited personal coach, ACC, and a certified meditation teacher. He won the Gold Award in the Rising Stars category at the 2022 Learning Awards, but Federico first came to the UK only five years ago. At the time, he didn't know anybody here and didn't speak English. So, Jay Curtis, Head of Themes, what did we talk about? It's an inspiring story, John, from washing dishes as a lonely immigrant in 2017 to winning a prestigious learning award. And of course, in the middle of that time, there was a global pandemic that called for a radical pivot by the company he eventually came to work for. You covered that story, but also his discovery of mindfulness meditation as a technique for helping him and his learners cope with the upheavals of the past few years. I'm in awe of Federico's achievement that I think gives us all hope for the future of learning. There are so many points of interest for learning professionals in this story. Just give it a listen. And I think you'll be as wowed as I and my fellow judges were by this rising star. So Federico, welcome to The Learning Hack. And can I first of all congratulate you on winning the Rising Stars category of the Learning Awards for this year. So we first met online, uh, of course, when I was judging the awards. uh, And I was very honoured to be asked to do that by the LPI. Thanks, guys. And I was so impressed by your story. I remember thinking at the time that I'd love to have you on the podcast, whether or not you win the award. Luckily, my fellow judges all agreed with me that you were a very impressive young person. And... And we met up in person at the award ceremony where you won gold. And that was a great night. Um, So how did it feel to win that award? And has it instantly changed your life? Um, Well, first of all, thank you for having me here, John. And uh, and uh, and I said definitely I was uh, I was very, you know, very happy you mentioned that. Well, you were kind of interested of of having me here even before I I won the awards. And and I think, um, yeah, I mean, it's been quite um, quite a journey, I would say, and these are the you know the award has been beyond my sort of winning the award has been by beyond my expectations in a way. Um, it, was, it was really a special evening, a special event organized by the LPI, um, and I think in a way for me what it felt like it was a bit of you know a lot of sacrifice, hard work, you know, and uh, diligence as well, uh, but passion in what I was doing. They're kind of coming together in you know in one in one event, really in one moment. Uh, so that definitely was very, very special. And for me, definitely there was no necessarily a big expectation of, you know, uh, winning. I knew that I'd done my best, uh, as I normally, I normally do. I would say in terms of the, you know, you mentioned it changed my life. Um, I, I don't think, I mean, maybe change your life is a bit, is a bit uh, too much. But I would say uh, definitely for sure has created some, you know, some, some exposure, I have to say. And, and uh, something that... Uh, allowed me to connect with many people in the industry and definitely you know would be important for my career moving forward um uh, but ultimately i feel like more than anything else it has given me some confidence that what i'm doing you know it's it's um uh, you know it's important matters uh and you know that i'm on the right track on the right path uh and i have to continuously in a way develop my skill um learn and uh because of course i mean especially i think i speak from the fact that you know what we do is you know is about teaching uh teaching and training and 
you know, giving people the best to, to succeed in what they do, depending, of course, on what different industry we work in. But ultimately, I'm the first day. It's always like they're constantly learning, uh, passionate about that. So ultimately, becoming more skillful, more resourceful for, for the future. And uh, yeah, and make, uh, in a way, great things, great things happen. So take us back to where your story starts or the story that you told us in the awards submission with your arrival in the UK five years ago. Um, five years isn't a very long time um, <laughs> no. when you think of what you've crammed into it. So, but first of all, what drew you to this country and what was your life like at that time just after you landed? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, good question. I think, um, yeah, I, I would say to you, uh, to the point of the five years, I guess, Five years are, uh, yeah, not a long time in a way, um, and a lot has happened during those those years. I think before, well, before moving to the UK, I was uh, I was living in Bari, uh, which is a city in uh, in the south of Italy, it's quite a medium-sized city, it's quite a student city, and I was there for, because I was finishing my master, my my bachelor in uh, management engineering. Uh, at that t that time, I was um, also uh, running uh, sort of my own business. It was uh, you know in in the clothing industry. Mm -hmm. um, and I was involved both in sort of for really studies and that, so quite a, quite a busy time. But uh, what happened is that when I finished the, um, when I was about to finish the studies, it was the summer of uh, 2016. Uh, I, I had a sudden realization. This realization, in a way, happened in a in a very, uh, I would say, random way. So I was walking down uh, the street of, of Bari, just uh, you know, basically buying some grocery and things like that. So and I got stopped by an English. A uh, couple uh, on that street, and and they uh, they were asking me for for in, for information about you know directions essentially, and that was quite uh, and that moment when they asked me that question, I was pretty much petrified because I I, I didn't know what to say, uh, and and that gave me a, a sudden realization that actually if I I knew that I was ambitious, I knew I had very you know big plan for the future in my career, uh, and I realized how English was needed and uh, was an important part of all of that uh, and in a way I, I knew that deep down but I kind of not necessarily pay too much attention to it you know because at anyway, school I've never been interested in languages I've always been invo involved in football uh, and all these sort of things so uh, that that was a one first event and then the second event was that during that time a, a friend of mine that was living in the in um, uh, had studied in Glasgow uh, in Scotland you know told me that Told me a bit more about the life, you know, in Scotland, in England, uh, and that he had then found a job after after that in the UK, um, mm. and, and in a way that planted a seed in my in my mind about um, what what to do next. Uh, I called my intention in the beginning was to continue my master in Italy in the same university, mm -hmm. uh, but then I I had that gap period in the summer and I had a few weeks to think about that and then. I think these two events together caused me to make a decision and, and I actually seek, sought help to my friend and asking him if he knew anybody in the UK that could host me arriving there. And he knew a, a lady in, uh, in Birmingham where essentially uh, she, she could have hosted me. Uh, so I would have arrived there and have some somewhere to stay because the problem was that, you know, without, you know, having a job or having, you know, a bank or something in the UK it was quite difficult to find anywhere place. So mm. I had that sort of support uh, in a way. And that connection was the reason really why that uh, led me to the UK. I think it was, uh, for me, it was important to accelerate that. And I needed, I couldn't study the English on my own. It wouldn't have worked. I was, uh, you know, by, by that point, you know, when you are uh, 22, you, you really, yeah, or, or, you, or you learn English fast or otherwise, you know, it gets more, more and more difficult. So uh, I think that was really what led me to the UK. And, and being very honest, I didn't know much about the UK overall. I mean, about England as a culture, as, uh, you know, very, very, very little information. So I arrived there just quite uh, as if somebody had thrown me there <laughs> and then I had to figure it out from there. Yeah, so basically you came over here to study, to do your masters over here, yeah. Before I took a, I took a gap here uh, and yeah. my intention when I came to UK was simply to learn English. That was my first intention. So my, right, my intention okay. was, okay, I want to learn, uh, I want to take a gap here, maybe six months uh, learning English uh, and then perhaps coming back to Italy. That was my initial intention when I arrived. So my aim was mm -hmm. to find any job uh, so that I could practice my English, also sustain myself in the meantime. Uh, yeah. So that that's how I, uh, that was, uh, you know, the, the initial kind of, yeah, intention. 
Okay, so yeah, I, I, I'm going to kind of repeat in a way, some people will know this, but basically you came here five years ago and you didn't speak any English and you learned yeah. to speak English and five years later you win a top business award. <laughs> so that, I mean, that's quite astonish, astonishing. Um, so how did you get your working career kick-started over here and what did you have to learn in order to do that? Obviously you had to learn English, which you, you, you did very quickly. I mean, it's not an easy <laughs> language to learn, but what else did you have to learn as well? And how did um, you learn it? Yeah, so I think, um, well, I think starting from the English piece, uh, definitely uh, there are a few uh, factors that kind of helped me with that. In a sense, I had, uh, first of all, I exposed myself a lot to the to the right environment. So I was living with, um, uh, with English people. Uh, mm -hmm. I was uh, work, I found a job, um, you know, after a while in, a, in, a, in a one of, you know, the many Costa coffee that you find. Uh, and they oh, were yeah. like quite, uh, quite um, all English people there uh, and actually was quite lucky to be honest because the the owner I mean the manager of one of the stores was uh, in Birmingham was uh, from Bangladesh actually and he gave me a shot because I had a lot of um, I had a lot of trial trial shift that I did the different restaurant bars across across Birmingham and I got rejected quite a few times simply because my English was not to the level required uh, and definitely mm. I was struggling with that um, and also I didn't have any experience before in hospitality or anything like that so that was quite demoralizing at the beginning but then after that uh, I think when he gave me the opportunity at the beginning I, well, all I was doing is simply washing dishes that's the only things I could really do because yeah. I couldn't interact with anybody at the tail uh, couldn't you know accept order and uh, you know um, and I couldn't communicate very well with my team anyway so that's why for them was also quite frustration, but I guess again, again, that manager gave me an opportunity, and I think it's because of also his past and uh, the same difficulties he had when he arrived first in the UK. So very grateful for mm -hmm. for him. I remember, st I still remember his name, Joino. Um, so it's uh, yeah, it's really an important person at the beginning, uh, and I guess then I, slowly, slowly, I also exposed myself to a lot of social interactions. I used to go in different, you know, um, events. Uh, in spite of the knowing English, so I really pushed myself to. Uh, and I learned, I learned the, you know, how it felt very uncomfortable, very, very mm. extremely uncomfortable. But I think it was quite. Uh, in, it told me uh, that that being uncomfortable really sped up my 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 learning because I think if you think about it, when you learn languages, you're learning it in your in your country. You might feel a bit of uh, self consciousness in terms of really talking with people or maybe you feel like oh they're gonna judge me if i can't talk well all of this sort of stuff and it's something i always said you know uh, when it came to languages in my country right so because you compare yourself to others and maybe it might be better than you and so forth but when you are for necessity you have to speak the language uh you don't have any other choice so therefore mm -hmm. you need to necessarily uh, find a way to communicate um so i think that was a really something that sped up the process and then from there when I identified that I wanted to continue my study in the UK, um, I, I realized, okay, cool. Now my English after six months was really starting to to progress fast. Uh, I was, I mean, if I look at a bit, I look at it as a, an exponential curve every time. Uh, I guess I was getting to the point where that exponential curve was starting to kick kick in. Um, I I thought, you know what? I think after I've done all this sacrifice, I could study in the UK. Why not? And then. From that, I I studied. I did some proper studies in terms of uh, you know academic English. Uh, mm -hmm. Did my IELTS, which is one of the most important, uh, I would say, international sort of uh, um, uh, accreditation when it comes to English uh, that is okay. required by universities. Um, and every university has a minimum requirement for that. So then I, they allowed me really to um, overcome their first hurdle. Uh, and I was after eight months I've been in the UK, I, I was really astonished by the level I'd, I'd achieved in such a short space of time. But I do believe, it, apart from, of course, I, I, I do know that I've been very disciplined. I always studied uh, and I accompanied, I think, the grammar side of things with the actual speaking day to day and the listening. Mm -hmm. uh, but on top of it, there was uh, also my, the environment, I think, was key. And I do believe in that a lot. So in terms of choosing the right environment, choosing some of the right factors to to involve, uh, and and because I, I've had other people that of course have come from my country, maybe gone to London, but have been surrounded by other Italians, let's say, or you know people who speak English very well, that definitely mm -hmm. caused them to take much longer to get to a very good level of English. Um, and then from there, you know, I, my master was in innovation technology management, so um, I was quite uh, in a way quite quite involved with technology innovation. 
uh, there was a lot of writing as well involved. Because, uh, that was one of the main differences between, I think, the Italian um, education system and the English one in England. I found there is a lot of focus on critical thinking, uh, and you know, mm -hmm. you use that to to write your you know your essays, your assignments, um, and I think that really gave me the chance to really decide what were the topics I was most interested in and looking at different perspectives. Uh, and that, that for me was very important. But I was I was so also idealized, I was very much more interested in the, uh, I think in the economical side of things and the business side of things, uh, as well as the mm -hmm. human side of things. And and so to kick really after that, really to kick start my, my career in a way, um, uh, again, being very honest with that, I had no, clear idea where I wanted to go. All I knew is mm -hmm. I wanted to, I was very interested in, uh, I was I was very interested in psychology uh, already from there. And I had already known a bit about coaching as, as a profession in general. Um, and at the mm -hmm. time I was reading a few books about it and all these things. So at the beginning, actually my idea was coming out even of university was, oh, why not? Maybe I could go into HR. Uh, and because maybe in the future oh. I could get to become a coach. Uh, but then, oh, I see. yeah, so, then what what happened is I ended up in sales. <laughs> I was going to say, wait, when you joined GTS, GTS, yeah. your current employer, you originally started in sales, didn't you? First, I worked. Uh, first, I worked for a startup though. Uh, be between GDS and I worked uh -huh. for a startup, you know, really looking at um, sort of involved in a customer development journey. So it was a very early stage startup, and that kind of told me a lot about marketing and sales, but more of the developing and understanding the customers and, and you know, a sort of a, a discovery process, really. So I spent that uh, quite, you know, six months or so uh, after, you know, during the period at the end of university. Um, and then after that, I I joined uh, I joined GDS in, in a sales role. And I, I didn't know much about sales. I thought it wasn't for me necessarily. And also, as you may know, at university, don't talk a lot about a career in sales. So, um, but yeah, so then from that, you know, I, I joined GDS uh, and, uh, and yeah, and in, you know, because of anyway, I, had, I still already had some good communication skills. Of course, this was a lot, a lot to work on, but for me, it was very also very rewarding the fact that again, coming from the fact that I couldn't speak any English, I was in a in a in an in, I was in a in a job that required me to be very good in uh, in terms of you know words and language and so forth. Yes, of course, in sales, you have to be able to talk well. To people yes exactly yeah so how did you I mean, obviously you're very successful at within sales but how did you make the move to learning within that company um so right so i think what the first uh, element that i think enable all of that is that i was in a growing organization so when i joined in 2019 mm -hmm. uh, um, i started in sales i um i I focused, I mean, for really first six months were quite hard and really focused on developing uh, really the, some of the most important skills that, you know, every salesperson, you know, may, may have. And and I think uh, what's happened is after having done that for about a year and a half and uh, performing, you know, at the, at the top, I, uh, the company was uh, in, a, in a phase of a high growth and the growth was actually determined by COVID, uh, I have to say. So... COVID really moved the organization from being, you know, a steady growth year on year to move into an organization that um, in 2020 grew by 70% uh, and that in in 2021 grew by 100%. So in that situation, I found myself an organization hiring, we're hiring a lot of commercial uh, salespeople across the board, mm -hmm. you know, with different roles, talking about sales executive, uh, you know, as SDRs, uh, account executive and so forth. Um, and um, and from there, there was an opportunity for me to, because I had, I was training as, as a coach myself. So I really went for uh, the accreditation with International Coaching Federation in, uh, you know, as an associate certified coach, you know, I took a, about eight, six months training plus on top of that, you know, during the, the practice. I think that that really led me to uh, create, being known in the company as somebody who had this uh, coaching skills. So, I started. Yeah. I did. I was doing already a lot of work in sales coaching, so really helping one to one and group uh, different salespeople to perform better or anywhere to overcome some other, you know, challenges uh, mentally. You know, because we know all of us that we know that COVID COVID period was quite a tough one. Um, and then yeah, the company created a training department, so they hired a, a, a very senior leader in uh, in training with 15 years of experience working in different companies like uh, HP, Dell. 
um, you know, go carless uh, okay. and and also Vim software and. Uh, and, and that, yeah, in a way, inherited me, uh, and uh, I, I, I had the chance over the, the following two, two years or so to really learn a lot, absorb a lot about the best practices in, in, uh, in learning, and I found myself in a, in a role that um, was really passionate about and really fit with my values and what I really um, enjoy doing as, as a whole, I guess. So I guess to, to, sh- to summarize in terms of what I said, I guess it, there was a combination of be, having done very well in, in the role uh, myself and knowing I've been taking a very much uh, a very skill focused approach, uh, but also the growing organization that really required and the need for creating a new training department and training, learning and development department. Okay, so you found as if you'd really fallen on your feet when you found L and D. That's obviously the the, the the fit, the thing that you wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, just to kind of backtrack there a bit, the, the the reason that the company got such a boost in the pandemic, that's presumably because it's an online based company, yeah? Yeah, so the company was is an event services company. And interestingly, when, when COVID hit, um, the company uh, had, had to cut the, you know, the headcount by quite a bit. At that time, we were about, you know, between 400, 500 people in the company. So uh, what happened mm. is that a lot of the conferences, as you may know, you know, were cancelled, all of that, and uh, 75% of the yeah, revenue yes. of the company were coming from, from that side of things. So then there was a transition mm. to the company was able to pivot very quickly into uh, digital events, uh, so creating okay. virtual uh, experiences. And, and that's what boosted the company because a lot of other event company went bust or anyway went bankrupt. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the budget that uh, some of our sponsors used to utilize for big events and conferences was free now. So the company was able to capture that and really deliver the same results they were looking for uh, through a digital mean. And that was, uh, I think, the, the the shift that then uh, propelled the company into into you know into the future uh, with with the growth that is experiencing right now as well. In a way, it's a, a, a fairly standard route into training because very few people begin life thinking, you know, I really want to be an L and D or CLO when I grow up, mm. you know, when they're ten or whatever. But a, a quite a, a, a frequent story I hear is that people started, well, I was the, you know, really hotshot salesperson or I was a really hotshot marketing person. So I ended up training all the other people mm. to bring them up to my standard. Yeah. So I got into training, decided I really liked that. And then it went into the kind of generalist uh, training role. How was it going from knowing all about sales and how to coach sales to uh, doing other stuff because I think your work on onboarding was a big focus in your submission. So what, what was it like making the transition from being a, a, a trainer in sales to being to taking on onboarding? Yeah, as, as so I, I guess, um, I think first of all, yeah, I think first of all, I think importance when you start training people, you need to realize that um, you need to have a focus on the other side, really. So on the on the learner itself and understanding how they best learn and uh, and uh, what the way you you communicate. Because of course you might have a, uh, not. To be honest, I mean there there is a say that say you know that salespeople are not the best uh, you know teacher, the best trainers, or all that stuff, right? So I think there is a or even the best managers. It's yeah, quite exactly. Hard to find very a true. very good sales manager. Very true. Yeah. Very true. I think there is a very different. A lot of the time, you know, salespeople get get you know the best one they get put us in managerial roles and they're not very good at actually uh, uh, you know increasing the performance of their team actually performance may go down so and i think because there are yeah. of course, important traits and maybe sometimes organizations don't provide enough support and actually training to those people to develop those managerial skills i think what what, what i was lucky and i think it was on my side really because most of my my proactive intention to really uh, you know invest in myself and i think it was the the coaching side of things i think coaching doing that the a proper accreditation in coaching with many hours of trainings, um, I think really made me understand one thing is about um, you giving advice to people, uh, but and one thing is really allowing the other person to internalize certain concept, information, uh, practical knowledge that then they can utilize based on their motivators as well. So I think mm-hmm. coaching, uh, I invested myself at almost ten thousand pounds myself. It was not even the company because there I wasn't the stage where the company could could sponsor them because it wasn't really a requirement. But I did it myself and I spent my own money to develop their skills because I, I believed in that. Um and I be- I believed I was uh, very interested in in uh, developing others but also you know personal development in general. So 
that really facilitated, if I have to say, the transition. Uh, because without what I knew through the coaching uh, skills and what, what that actually means to traditionally, you know, use coaching as a tool, uh, I wouldn't have had all of the understanding about people and how they learn and how they develop, uh, you know, without it. So I think, first of all, I think that's an important piece. And then mm-hmm. when uh, when it came to a lot of these coaching skills is something I leveraged during my, my sales coaching uh, that I was doing. But of course, as you rightly mm-hmm. pointed out, a lot of the time I, I, I did some informal training session where, for example, you know, I was the top performer. Therefore, they, you gather, you know, 40 people on the floor, you know, come in a room and then you, you teach them what you're doing. So what, what makes you successful? Why are you doing so well? So I've done quite a lot of that. And also, I, I think interestingly that is uh that time i was also uh, i was pushing myself quite a bit uh, in in being comfortable in speaking in front of a lot of people and uh, i probably probably might be aware of you know the association toastmaster which is you know um can be you know it's it's essentially you know when it's an association for public speaking where you know you can go there and be be a member to to actually practice your public speaking skills in an environment which is quite um quite I would say safe uh, because everyone yeah. there is there for the same reason uh, they're all trying to uh, you know to to push themselves and really uh, be, be better communicators in front of others and get getting over that fear of being judged by you know by a, um, a group of strangers in a way so I think interestingly that's something I started even prior to to having this opportunity to start training people and I think looking back yeah. I have to say that probably that was one of the most important thing I could have done for my life because uh, I think without doing that I wouldn't have been ready to take up the opportunity of actually when they ask me you know what can you do some some training session in front of many people I was at that that point I was ready I said yeah why not I'll do it but I do know that over the previous six months I I had to essentially get over my fear of of you know sharing my stories uh, of you know telling what I knew and, and and having that sort of foundation and assurance that uh, what I was saying, you know, was important and could help people really. Uh, so I think that was another important element. So in a way, I, I always said, pre- in a way, interesting, I'd always said that preparation there, the opportunity came my way, but I was prepared for them. And this is because I was constantly learning, constantly trying to develop myself in without necessarily the company having to um, encourage me to do that. I was very proactive, I have to say. And then, as you can imagine, then when it comes to onboarding, because my organization was uh, growing very fast. Um, yeah, let's get on to the onboarding. Yeah, uh, program. so it's, it's a big focus in your submission. So can you can you give us the case study if you like? Sure, onboarding. absolutely. So I think my organization was um, trying to. Um, yeah, so the, the organization there was a big requirement organization at the end of uh, the end of twenty twenty because uh, we were expected to hire. A, a quite a high number of commercial roles. Um, in fact, I mean, l- looking forward, I guess we last year onboarded 195 people uh, to the organization. Mm. So that's a quite uh, a high high volume. Um, mm. And I run about 14 uh, onboarding uh, with, again, with people like groups of 15 to 20 people or so, depending on, on, the, on the court. We were doing an onboarding every three weeks or so. So what happened is that when uh, when the new VP of Training and Performance joined the business at the end of 2020 was for me one of the, my ha- the, the ask was we need to build a, a solid onboarding program we don't we don't have any uh, and the one we have is a two day two three days program where we just give an introduction to the company and all of the the learning happens in the um, in the in, in uh, yeah I would say all, all happens with. Uh, with managers so on the job learning really you get on you know get oh, yeah. handed over to the manager and then the manager teaches you everything so there is no consistency there no as no like a proper onboarding experience and that was required because with high, such a high volume we needed to retain more staff and, and that was important as you know sales is also a profession in general that is quite there is more turnover compared to other professions so um, that was required with about a month and a half to really build a new onboarding program. First, the first week, uh, and then looking at potentially developing a second week. And the VPO training and performance had just joined, didn't know much about um, about the, the requirement and the organization itself. So I was the only one that could start quickly building some stuff. So from there, 
Uh, of course, after that, having taken a lot of different courses that is adjusting me on uh, other learning principles, on uh, you know uh, instructional design and, and 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 so forth, and also like measuring learning effectiveness. So what I did is I started developing this onboarding uh, liaison with stakeholders, with our CEO, our CEO, VP of Sales, VP of Performance, uh, and then I started building this uh, this program that was supposed to you know be rolled out from uh, from the uh, the beginning of, of February. Um, hmm. So I, and at that point, of course, we were still mostly working virtually. So it was it was going to be delivered uh, virtually, uh, but we knew that anyway, at some point it was going to be more of an hybrid situation. You know, starting to come back in in the classroom by by April or so, uh, 2021. Uh, so yeah, that was that was really the, the first rollout. We did the rollout. Um, of course, we. What I did be, what I did even before starting that rollout, I measured how things had, had gone. F- at, up to that point. So what was the, mm-hmm. the experience like? Um, how long it what was the, the metrics and the KPIs that people were eating in the first uh, two weeks and a month in the, in the role. So I did a kind of a, a snapshot of what the current state looked like. And then from there, you know, for the first six months has been uh, of rolling out that program has been a bit of an iteration process. Really, every time I was having a new a new group, I would then gather feedback, improve it, make it better, co- constantly checking with the stakeholders. Uh, and then I, I started building as well the second week onboarding myself uh, again with the support and the frameworks that were provided by by my VP of training. Um, and then um, I the following six months was all about measuring really what were the benefits of what we had done and moving from you know mm-hmm. two three days onboarding to a full two weeks onboarding and then also looking at developing the first three months of learning journey for a for a new com- for different commercial roles coming to the business. I think that was. Yeah. Um, allowed me really that high volume of people coming to the business allowed me to experiment a lot try uh iterate and really then deliver results for the organization in the struggle against the forgetting curve that learning people are engaged in every day there are no magic formulas but there is science for well over a century psychologists have known that the spacing effect unlocks deep learning and helps learners power through to peak performance and yet who uses it despite the fact that modern learning systems like LXPs make it almost easy. I've written a white paper with Learning Pool that shows how you can use the spacing effect to beat the forgetting curve. Download it now. Meet the evolving nature of work with Cornerstone Explore, a holistic people growth experience that delivers a fully integrated, personalized journey of learning, skill development, and career mobility for every person. I share all the ways Cornerstone Explore is designed and personalized for the ways your people want to grow and work, but this is only a 30 second ad. To learn how you can unite people growth with business success, visit csod.info slash future ready. So the judges should the award were particularly impressed by the way you measured and evaluated the program. I mean, you've done all four levels of Kirkpatrick and ROI evaluation. And, um, you know, I don't know if it's surprised you, but it's, it's actually quite rare that, that people do evaluation as thoroughly, thoroughly as, as we heard mm-hmm. uh, during that submission. Can you tell about the like the, the, the mechanics you used to, to get your data, with sure. quantitative, qualitative, how you measured the ROI of the program? Um, yeah, so I think... Uh, there was a there were a mix of things. Uh, first of all, I think it all started. The reason why I've been very proactive with that is I also have to thank my again VP of training performance. He told me and he made me understand that um, you can look at L and D or you can look at sales enablement as a strategic function and not just a support function. And I think that was an, mm-hmm. an important distinction. And to be a strategic function, you need to really measure how um, you, what the intervention you're doing. Um, are impacting the business itself. So it all starts anyways from from understanding what are the business needs and then that will then translate into what are the performance needs in a sales environment, right? Uh, and then looking at the learning needs and the learner needs. So that's where everything everything started from. Um, from that, that was the way of thinking. So I think after that, so I I actually did a few courses on learn, you know, measuring learning effectiveness uh, to really understand, okay, the four levels of Kirkpatrick's and I mean, if you look at the, the also the, the even like uh, one level above, there is also uh, the Philips ROI model as well that you know yeah, is always connected with Kirkpatrick. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I think it was. Um, um, 
after during that six six months the first six months right so as i said it was a lot of iteration i knew where where we started what were some of the measurements we're really looking at what was the satisfaction scores breaking it down into different areas like role preparation engagement uh, uh relevance of, of the content and so forth um and i looked at what what you know what were the performance uh, talking about you know setup calls uh and vid video discovery calls that uh, some of the uh, salespeople were making uh in the first two weeks coming out of what was called onboarding still at that time but uh also looking at um yeah so i guess these were the, the main element really look at the performance what was it like before onboarding so then after after those six months I started to measure group, uh, group uh, after group after group. I started to continuously measure all of these metrics. So I was measuring, first of all, what was satisfaction scores, uh, and I was measuring the first week and the second week, um, and really looking. This was very much qualitative, right? So because we were talking about reaction at that point, right? So really reaction of how yeah. um, you know people are perceiving the training and what they feel like, whether they feel prepared to embark on and join the you know their team i think my my aim with that was really about them feeling prepared i'm not saying confident in the job but really prepared mm -hmm. because there were a lot of people maybe some of some of them were completely inexperienced was their first role in sales some other were more experienced with a couple of years of experience and others were five years of experience but particularly for those guys that were new I think uh, it was important that they would felt they were giving all the tools uh, to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has always been my, my extreme focus. Uh, and that's why it was for me very important to measure that because I wanted to, for them to have a great experience and come in the role feeling not terrified about, about the job uh, because it's quite hard to having to interact with C-level executive when you are, you might be very young mm -hmm. and holding that conversation on the same level uh, on the phone, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not an easy skill to have. So. I think that was really important. Uh, and then um, uh, from there, really measuring, looking at the, I started looking maybe at the behavioral side of things. So really looking at, um, are they applying the technique and the sales methodology that we have told them? Uh, so for that, we utilized, you know, scorecards and we had the manager doing observation and, you know, evaluating with the scorecards, the, the different salespeople. Okay. So really... Uh, we broke it was an evaluation that came from the from the manager. Yes, part yeah. of that the manager. We're also as as a tier, I mean, as a training and development team, we're going around the floor as well and, and doing this observation ourselves. So really breaking down the skills okay. that were we we were teaching them. So for example, if we're looking at setup process, how they set up calls for the more experienced salespeople, what are the four key comp competencies we are looking for, right? So and we were measuring them against on a scale from one to five, you know, where by hearing them on calls, on live calls, and so forth. So uh, providing directional feedback, all of that. So we looked at what that looks like in the first two weeks. Are they applying immediately? The, are they having the right behavior? It doesn't matter whether they haven't developed yet the full scale because of course that comes with time. But we can mm -hmm. see whether the direction is right. So that means that we have we have conditioned them in a way that is the way the business wanted to. Um, so that was the second level. Uh, and then we started looking at the third level, which was more related to the, the actual performance of, of sales. So really, if we tie okay. that to the onboarding, uh, for us, I consider that a lot of um, um, the measurement was happening in areas of business where the uh, the the product that we were, I mean, the product we're selling was a, a product which is not a very complex enterprise solution. So we're talking about to, I would say on a, on a medium scale, it's not, not fully transactional, but in the middle, I would say. So uh, we're talking okay. the ideal value for this for these guys will be anywhere in the range of two and a half grand to three grand. Um, and, so, yeah. and what happened is that we were, of course, when a, a salesperson was coming out of the onboarding, mostly, uh, of course, here yeah, I'm not considering a lot of the other commercial role, like the customer success or all these other roles. With, this is not something we measure directly because these were at the end of the, the actual funnel once we got the client and all of that. Uh, mm -hmm. But mostly looking, okay, when they come out of the onboarding, the, one of the most important performance metrics we can look at is how many setup they manage to do for our uh, more experienced salespeople. So, okay. um, so what we looked at, okay, in the first two weeks are the, mostly the one that they would correlate, they would connect directly to the onboarding because they are coming out of two weeks onboarding and going off the floor. The first two weeks are really the one that mostly correlate to what we have done in the onboarding because they're still after beyond that there is all top that has to do with management and the quality of management and how they are you know managed as well. Um, 
So what I what we did we I had measured that already as I said before when everything started before the onboarding. So I remeasured that. So we had uh, over time what happened is that we started from a point at the beginning of the first onboarding where the average for of scheduled calls uh, per day uh, <clears throat> yes per day was across across I mean all of the the entire court was 0 0.7 um, uh, scheduled call uh, per day. Um, we moved uh, uh, to 1.3 uh, there, so there was an 85% increase, uh, and that was sustained consistently for the following six months. So it really was a solid metric. It was we we knew that every time a group would come out of the onboarding, they would be eating that number over and over again. The average would be always that uh, around that number. Uh, so that was important uh, for us. Was important to actually demonstrate that the behavior where we had conditioned actually was, uh, you know, was providing good result. Of course, more set up than automatically you know provide more more leads uh at the at the at the at the, at the, at the, at the beginning of that funnel and therefore that was re was going to create more more deals average as a whole so what happened from that in terms of the deal average the deal average at that time before we started working was on 0 0.4 deal uh mm -hmm. and we moved that uh, i mean i'm talking per person and then we moved that up to uh 0 0.75 over the first two weeks on mm -hmm. average so um, so what happened there again it was a similar increase. It was about 87% increase, um, and and that was measured simply because we knew the deal value uh, very easily. I could measure that. I knew the deal value. I knew what that difference between 0 0.4 to 0 0.75 uh, translated, considering a court of 100 uh, sales professionals. So that then turned out to be in the range of 175k. Um, within the first just within the first two weeks not even considering what there might be the impact in the so long that term gets you to your roi if you take into account yes. the you know the costs that would yes the so then then can 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 consider that i think i what, what i wasn't able to measure uh, yet and i think that was more difficult to do and and definitely more difficult to connect is in the long term what there might <clears throat> might, might look like right so because when it comes to sometimes you know for for beyond that really measuring even more the ROI of other training activities you know may require even one year before you can see the actual the actual result of what yeah. you're doing so it's, it's quite challenging particularly yeah. um for me where we were the, the you know the training team was not big at all so we have me VP of training performance that was me and then I started when I got promoted as well I started to manage another person that was helping me with the, the ongoing coaching and the training and, and all of that sort of stuff but this was a bit of the reasoning behind what, what we did so of course, as, as I said, it was a, a mix of qualitative at the beginning for reaction, but then beyond that, it was mm. all quantitative through different tools. Of course, we have we used Salesforce. Our, it was our main CRM that integrated with a lot of other systems that allowed us to see to see a lot of the the metrics there. Very impressive. Thank you. So of the five years you've spent here, uh, Federico, a pretty hefty chunk of it was under pandemic conditions, uh, which no doubt imposed some constraints, but also has been a bit of an enabler for the technology side of learning. Obviously, it was good for the company that you're working in because it was an online events company, but um, it's also an enabler for technology supported learning. What part did COVID play in shaping the way you've developed your learning practice towards winning this event? Um, and I gather also that mindfulness has become important for you. And could you tell us how that relates? To sure. I, I think, um, yeah, definitely. I, definitely is very true. I think if you consider that I joined the business in 2019, then we knew that the actual pandemic then impacted the way business is done around March 2020. So I think from that point, you know, there was most of the time, you know, I was working from home fully. Um, and, and I think um, that shaped a lot in terms of, uh, look, actually, had a big influence in our look at the development of people uh, within the organization. So we all know that uh, the pandemic itself was quite a hard, uh, and you know, in terms of mentally, uh, and uh, as you can imagine, that's particularly for for a role in commercial roles, which are quite can be quite stressful by themselves. So then, of course, that can really mm. uh, escalate pretty quickly. And we had a lot of you know, auto mental health issues during that time within organization. And this was also why the reason why I was also coaching some people, trying to support more, you know, the, the our growing workforce. Um, I think 
talking about you know way mindfulness in a way what happened there is that made me think about because i was the first one to struggle of course during that time as well with my mental health it wasn't that periods you know, it was, wasn't wasn't easy you know and I'm, I'm the first one to admit that and i'm and i also come from a family situation that relate a lot to mental health i'm very aware of it and i know what that means um and uh, and then i think that's what comes from my interest and in being an advocate for that within organization so i thought Okay, so we focus on the learning a lot in terms of job skills. So we develop the the, peop- mm. the, the skills that people need to uh, have to do their job well. And I think, as we discussed now in the previous question you asked me, John, in terms of you know the, the onboarding side of things, that's what a lot of the focus in a way, you know, looking at okay, what are the skills we need to teach people, what they need to develop, uh, and therefore we try and you know and uh, timely we provide them you know the resources and 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 you know the the, the opportunity to actually develop those skills. So. However, um, over time, I start thinking, you know what, but we we are, you know, beyond, beyond the numbers, there are always, you know, people. So ultimately, there is a, mm. psych, a psychology uh, behind those people. Uh, and uh, and I, 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 w- I was of the belief that if people are um, healthy mentally um, and they are quite resilient from that perspective, automatically they will perform better. There is, there is absolutely no doubt to that. So I, th- I thought, okay, well, what are then the the psychological processes that underpin, uh, you know, high performance, regardless of, you know, of the job. And, and at that time, I had the fortune that, you know, because of my, you know, my coaching development, I come across a lot of methodology and I came across a methodology called acceptance and commitment training, uh, which is also utilizing therapy, is, is mindfulness based and is a sort of, a, I would say, an, in, an interesting, um, as a slightly different angle of compared to cognitive behavioral therapy, but really based on, on mindfulness. And I did, I started to look at that, what, what were the underpinning principle of that? And I felt like they would apply very well to the, you know, to the situation, uh, you know, I was in. Uh, and then what happened, I developed like a sort of a model, like like sort of pyramid that I, I also showed you, I remember in during that, that presentation where you're not looking at the, yeah. the actual, just at the job skill specific, uh, job specific skills. And then on top of that, on the additional skills that people that will make people more efficient, more effective. But really at the bottom having a sort of a level zero, which I call psychological processes and you know that there were five main psychological processes and really looking at what can you do, what can how can you integrate uh, these processes within the, the training curriculum and uh, within all of your you know instructional design efforts. So what I started to do I started to integrate in more psychology from the start of the process, really from onboarding uh, uh, really looking at some of these elements and moving forward as well of the first three months, uh, you know, development a journey of, of a new hire in the organization, really teaching those those principles and then making them part of, of the learning curriculum, not just as a separate wellness or well-being program, but really embedding that within the systems of what we do. Within the, oh, interesting. Yeah, so yeah. What, what, that, that, what that did is definitely impacted the prepared people for you know, when it gets tough, they have tools. They know they can rely on something. They they knew they know how to relate differently to their thoughts and emotion in a way that is uh, healthy and productive. And of course, I do believe, of course, that the culture then of the organization need to support all of that. I think in GDS there has been a lot of transformation over time around that. I think with that, they, there is a lot more that can be done uh, to create more of an environment of psychological safety as a whole. Um, I think. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I do I do know, and based on the feedback as well, I get which were more qualitative because of, uh, at, the, at the start of the process, really, these help people to first of all to prevent mental health issues. But at the same time, people were feeling more more satisfied with role and more prepared to face the challenges that a sales role brings with it. So, all of this mindfulness comes comes in because all of these methodology that I'm describing here, talking about the psychological processes, are based on our mindfulness and the idea that by changing the, it's not about it's not about changing how we think and uh, what our emotional state is it's more about changing the relationship we have with those thoughts and emotions even when when it gets difficult uh so you're able to stay present in spite of those thoughts and emotions that sometimes can be disruptive and and not creating a situation of what i call as experiential avoidance where people are, are avoiding certain emotions certain thoughts uh, and to, to avoid them they change their behavior and not behave in a way that is effective for them in the moment uh, and this creates, of course, impacts performance as well, because in performance environments, there are certain things that are the right thing to do uh, for them to achieve certain targets. And they learned, how can I do this, even if I'm, for example, I'm not in the mood, or maybe things are not very well at all. Um, 
how can I be able to take those thoughts and emotions more lightly, uh, I'll be aware of them and then refocus on the present moment. So I think that was a big focus and really shifted uh, a lot of how uh, I think about the developing of pe development of people. And to close, I would say that for me, organization have a big responsibility of not just being places where people can learn the skills to do the job, but actually I would call it as an incubator of personal growth for people, because I think people, when you help them become better human beings and, and also better people as a whole, more strong and more resilient, I think they are forever grateful for the company and also more loyal to the company itself. Uh, and I think that goes a long way for, for them. I think at the end of all that, people probably realize why um, we judges were so, uh, well, you knocked our socks off really, <laughs> and uh, why you won the award, and, and, and that's brilliant. <music> Lastly, how do you see your future career developing? Um, and maybe your current employer needs to put their hand over their ears at, at this point. What <laughs> hopes and goals do you have for what lies ahead? Right. Um, I think, um, so my goals, I think, yeah, so for sure, um, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll start always with the fact that for me, in spite of, you know, my my really, my approach of con constant learning, I, I would say to you probably over the last five years, there hasn't been a, a, a day or a week where I haven't learned anything new. I'm a I'm very big reader. Um, I I'm always find different ways of, of learning. Um, I mainly absorb information by reading. If I have to be honest, books have always been my main source. Uh, I think as always, my, my focus for the future is really to really sharpen and improve my way of thinking, uh, really making better decision. I'm very strategic as, a, as naturally, and I think to improve that even more, it's important to understand how things work on a deeper level, really starting from principles and then building stuff on top of those principles. So uh, apart from that, I think, you, and, you, and I guess this is a big focus for your podcast here, is about technology in general, right? So I think uh, personally, I haven't been exposed enough to the use of technology in, in the learning uh, environment, right? So uh, in the learning industry. So I think there is a lot more that I can do with that and really seeking opportunities where I will have a chance to really work closely with technology and see how the, the technology can be leveraged uh, to support the learning of individual. Because I guess we're moving from a model where in learning was more standardized to a model where learning is more personalized. And also actually it's more driven by the individual, like, you know, um, a, a, continuous learning, a culture of continuous learning, a culture of uh, lifelong learning, which is required, I guess, because of how the world is changing and how fast it's moving. So, uh, I mean, we know we, we all know about skill gaps in different areas. And I think, you know, the only way, uh, you know, you reduce that really creating, using technology to support that, you know, the, the learning of people in a, in a timely way as well. So I think uh, that was is another area I think John where I see myself really try and develop more um, as as a professional, mm. um, and I think really combining what I know in terms of psychology, the, the human sense, the human being itself, with what technology can do. I believe that technology is great and it's important, but at the same time, it's not always the solution. Often, you know, technology gets implemented, uh, and but then the adoption rates are very low, or in, in the, tech, the 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 company is not ready for it. So it's important that always you look at what, what's the state of the organization, what's uh, the people as well, and uh, how they learn and what, what's the kind of role they do. So I think, yeah, definitely that's a big area for me. Um, and then uh, I think, I always see myself, I think I'm, I really want to, yeah, I mean, certainly developing organizations that are very forward thinking in that sense uh, and, and continually to every opportunity, but of course to, not only be a, a, a great trainer, and this is something which is very important. I really love uh, communication, public speaking. This is something I see myself doing more and more in the future. And I think that's why I want to really try to get to the cutting edge of things and really understand how, you know, the, the most uh, forward thinking people, because I, I want to be one of, one of those people in the future. Um, and, uh, and, and with that, I guess it's about as well understanding how can I better improve my managerial skills and really manage bigger teams in the future. So I think this is something that I foresee for myself over the next five years. Um, and, and really, I, I think ultimately I say to you, Ed, I'm, I feel very lucky and fortunate to have a very deep passion for learning. This is not something I've seen m much across my, my peers. I really love that, uh, and for me, it's learning in a way is not like a, a chore or anything like that. I'm doing it because <laughs> because I have to. I just love it uh, in the first place, and I think I love different ideas mm. and really bring them into new context. Uh, so I hope to do that more in the future. Really, 
bringing ideas from different areas and really implementing it in, uh, in the right time and in the right context and uh, yeah and really make a big impact with that so we'll be watching what you do uh, in the future and look forward to see what you do with the expanded technology kit and the growing knowledge that um, you accrue it's been really great to talk to you Federico thanks for coming in today and sharing your story thank you John uh, again I appreciate you inviting me here and uh, it's been a, my pleasure to share my some more about myself my story and uh, what I'm trying to do that's all on the learning hack podcast for this time many thanks to Federico and to our sponsors learning pool and cornerstone the learning hack is completely independent and transparently funded by sponsorship if you want to help others find us, please like, follow, rate, review and subscribe on your podcast platform of choice or on YouTube. Don't miss Great Minds on Learning next week and a truly fascinating conversation we have coming up with Julian Stodd. Stay curious, learning people. Now I finally get it.